Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to you all. We especially welcome our visitors who join us with us. Join with us today. Uh, today we will be not only hearing God's saving words, we're also receiving a new member into membership and receiving uh, the Lord's Supper. So thank and praise God for the service that uh, He's prepared for us today. We'll begin with prayer. O oh Lord God, our merciful Father, we come before you in awe and wonder as we consider the amazing love that you have shown to rebellious humankind in the suffering and death that your Son so patiently endured. Lord, fill us with an ever greater appreciation for the sacrifice that you made for us. All the worship and praise that we can give cannot thank you enough for what you have done for us. Accept our praise today and increase our faith and love for you. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Begin with our opening hymn, hymn 245, verses 1 through 4. of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. We have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from conception. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me, according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin, and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all of your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. We read responsibly from Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. 
Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. And then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. to look 
away from themselves into Christ, who would be the one high priest who would not only make the sacrifice, but would sacrifice himself. He was the great high priest with the great sacrifice because it wasn't something that needed to be repeated daily or yearly. No one sacrifice to cover all the sins of all mankind for all time. We read from Hebrews chapter 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of his, this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who is through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and believe it. desires to become a communicant member of Emmanuel Lutheran Church. Having completed a thorough investigation of scriptural teaching, he has been fully convinced that the Word of God is taught here in its truth and its purity, and that the sacraments are administered according to their instruction by Christ. Josh, in order that all might know that you share the same faith, conviction, and commitment to which the Spirit of Christ has led this Christian congregation, I now ask you, in the presence of God and of these people, do you accept the Holy Scriptures as the inspired, inerrant Word of God and the authoritative rule of faith and life? If so, then answer, I do. I do. Do you confess the common Christian faith as we express it in the Apostles' Creed? Then answer, I do. I do. Are you in agreement with the testimony of this Lutheran congregation as you have come to know it in your investigation of its teachings? Then answer, I am. I am. Do you intend to continue in your Christian confession according to the word of God, to make diligent use of the means of grace, and to strive to lead a life befitting a child of God even to the end? Then answer, I do so intend by the grace of God. I do so intend by the grace of God. Finally, do you desire to serve the Lord with the congregation under the form of an order of its constitution? Then answer, I do. I do. It is with great joy, then, that I extend to you the hand of fellowship and welcome you to all the privileges and opportunities of this community of faith. May God and the Holy Spirit keep our hearts united through the truth of his word in Christ our Savior. You may receive it. Well, to continue confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, as you can find them printed in the bulletin. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, 
and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll continue with our next hymn, Hymn 220. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins by his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The word of God which I would lay on your hearts this morning comes from John chapter 8. We'll be reading verses 46 through 59. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. And yet you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? And the prophets died. Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out from the temple. 
dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, what would it have been like to hear Jesus with your own ears, to sit there at his feet and learn from him, to, to listen in on his conversations? Surely he was a, 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 obviously a great teacher, a powerful communicator. On one occasion, the Apostle Matthew writes that when Jesus had finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. When Jesus was speaking, he was making his points with conviction, with clarity, with accuracy. And there was something about the way that he spoke which was so much different from everyone else. There was something about him that no one else could replicate. It wasn't his rhetoric. It wasn't his charisma. It was that when he spoke, he spoke with authority. It was almost as if God himself was speaking. Of course, it was God speaking. Jesus Christ, when he was on this earth 2,000 years ago, was God in the flesh speaking to us. And you would think that as people realized this and as they heard him speaking in a way that they'd never heard before, with, with true authority that comes from true power, the people would have just dropped everything that they had, gone running to go and listen to him. But that's not always what happened. And we see time and again through the New Testament that many listened to Jesus' words and did not truly hear what he was saying, but rather rejected him, disrespected him, hated him for what he was saying. We see that with the Jews in our text this morning. And yet Jesus points to their criticism of what he was saying and tells them that the reason why they didn't hear his words or didn't accept what he was, what he was saying was simply because they did not believe. They didn't have faith in their hearts. It is our hope in prayer that we can all avoid treating Jesus this way, and rather, when he speaks, we truly listen and give him the honor and respect that his words deserve. Because the first and most basic aspect of our faith is that when Jesus speaks, the Christian listens. They hear the voice of God talking, they receive his words as divine truth, and they cling to his words as the hope of eternal life. <coughs> I'm sure you've all driven a, a junker at some point in your life. Many of you probably your first car, or maybe a couple cars after that still were junkers. My first car was a 98 Honda Accord, which was great when I got it, and it died after only seven months, I think. I had a friend that drove a true junker, and it was so bad that inside, even the display on the radio didn't work. It was just totally dark. And if you were driving around with him and you wanted to turn to the Valley's Rock Station, you had to turn the dial and just sit there and listen. And you'd listen for a few minutes through the commercials, realize that you weren't anywhere close, go a couple more stations down, and, and just try and find the music that you wanted to listen to. Of course, that's a difficult thing. If you don't have a display on your, on your dashboard and you can't see what radio station you're tuned into, it's really hard to find the music and to listen to the music that you desire. It's a similar thing with faith. If we do not have faith in our hearts, if God has not blessed us with faith, it is impossible to tune into Jesus. It is impossible to hear his words without faith. Now, by faith, Christians hear the voice of God talking. Our text begins with some disappointment expressed on Jesus' part. He says, which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Imagine the frustration that Jesus must have felt. He was the creator of the universe. He had put these people here. He knew the numbers of hairs on their heads. He had put them in their position in life. And yet, they didn't want to hear him. Not only that, they were his chosen people. He had guided them out of Egypt through the Red Sea, guided them through the wilderness, providing them manna and quail to eat and live on. When they reached the Promised Land, he made sure that the, the enemies in the Promised Land were defeated before them. And he comes and he stands before them in their presence, and they don't care what he has to say. They will not listen to him. Imagine how frustrating that must have been. 
Now, part of the problem was the matter of appearances. See, Jesus, when he was here on earth, he hid his glory as God. If you looked at him, he didn't look like God. He looked like just any ordinary man. That can be difficult at times. Faith doesn't care what things look like. Now, Hebrews 11 says, Faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Faith looks past the visible outward signs and hears God's word and believes that that is really God speaking, regardless of how things appear. Unbelief, on the other hand, does not hear God's word. It only looks for the outward signs. That was because of these men's unbelief that they looked at Jesus, said, he's only not even 50 years old yet. He can't truly be God. And they rejected him. Their rejection at the end of our text, they said, or Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Jesus says those words, I am. That is Jesus claiming to be Jehovah God. Think back to Moses at the burning bush. Moses says, who who should I say is sending me to you? And he said, tell the people of Israel, I am has sent you to them. Jesus saying these words, he's not using a slip of the tongue. He is definitively stating he is Jehovah God. And that wasn't wrong for him to do. When God was speaking out of the burning bush, that was Jesus doing it. And here he is telling them yet again, here he is, Jehovah, in the flesh before you. People, however, thought that was wrong. They said, this man cannot be God. He blasphemes. They were so angry by what he said that they were even willing to kill him in church. While they were still in the temple, they took up stones in order to stone him. Of course, Jesus did a miracle then and fled. It is difficult at times to overcome the things we see with our eyes. It is a common idea among Christians in America that if you are truly teaching God's word, and if you are really a Christian church, then you are going to have thousands of people in the pews. You're going to constantly have new people joining your church. You're going to have hundreds of cars in the parking lot. That's how you know that you are truly a Christian church. That can be difficult for us at times. You look around us, we don't see people joining every Sunday. We did today, but not every Sunday, certainly. We don't have hundreds of cars in the lot, 20, maybe 30 tops. We don't see this tremendous growth taking place. But rather than basing what God says off of what we can see, let's shut our eyes for a moment and listen. Realize that the word of God, as it's read here in church, is truly God speaking. That when we come here and partake of communion, we are partaking of the Lord's body and blood. And when Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. What we don't have here at Emmanuel is far outnumbered by the tremendous blessings which God gives us through his holy word. His holy word which assures us Sunday after Sunday that our sins are forgiven and that we have peace with God. Yes, this is God speaking to you. When God speaks, it's time to close our eyes and listen and realize that the tremendous value that we get is not in numbers. It's in the message of salvation through Christ alone, which he offers us through that word. When Jesus speaks, the the Christian listens. Do you need guidance? Listen to God's word. Do you need wisdom? Listen to God's word. Do you need direction? Listen to God's word, because God's word has all those important things for your life. By faith, we accept his words as the divine Ultimate truth. Now, truth is one of those things that really captures our human psyche. Truth is so important to us, that's why we have all these different detective shows and murder mysteries and all these other crime shows. We always want to get down to the truth. Who done it? What was the motive? How did this come to be? 
kind of funny that we're so obsessed with truth because really we're pretty bad at the truth. In recent years, there's been several documentaries that publicized just how inaccurate eyewitness testimony can be at times. A, f- a couple studies that I read said up to 75% of false, of false uh, convictions are caused by inaccurate eyewitness statements. What happens is we see something happen maybe just in our periphery or barely see it at all. Then when we find out that this is what happened, all of a sudden we start going back and say, yeah, I did see that happen. And you start adding details, you start adding motives, you start adding a bunch of details that you easily did not see, but in your mind's eye you are seeing them now as clear as day. We add. We alter. We change things in our mind, and we are convinced that it is the truth. Really, many times it is a watered-down truth, or a partial truth, or just an outright lie that we think is accurate. You know, truth, when it is handled by humans, is not very certain at all. It's a wavering thing. What a blessing it is, then, that when God speaks, it does not waver. That when God speaks, it's not uncertain, because God's word is 100% truth. Jesus says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. When we read something in the Bible, we don't have to cross-check it. We don't have to wonder, is this really true? We don't have to go through deductive reasoning to figure out the truth of God's statements because when God says it, it is true, absolutely, 100% of the time. And it doesn't change either. It's just as true as it, it, today as it was thousands of years ago when it was written. God gives you absolute truth in his word. The blessing of this is that when we are presented with things in our lives that contradict God's word, we can weigh it against the word of God. We know which one is accurate. So if the debate is creation versus evolution, or the debate is pro-life versus pro-choice, or salvation by grace alone versus salvation by works plus faith, we know that God's word, whatever it says, must prevail. (coughs) So we need to hold on to the six-day, 24-hour day creation as God's word declares it. Evolution is not reconcilable with God's word. Darwin is wrong. God alone speaks the truth. We stand on the opinion that life begins at conception because God says it. He says that he forms us in our mother's wombs, that before we were even born, he has all of our days numbered. We stand on that truth in opposition to abortion. When God says that you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and all of this is a gift from God, none of it by your own input, so that you cannot boast about it, that doesn't square with our rationale. We say there has to be something that I can do, and yet we must stand on what God says, because that is the truth. It's the unshakable foundation of our faith, Human involvement is not needed. Every conflicting idea is false. Anything that conflicts with God's word must be replaced with the truth. This is all because of the two great truths that God gives us in Scripture, the law and the gospel. The law in which God points out a very certain truth about each one of us, that you are a sinner, that you deserve damnation, That because of your sins, you deserve to rot in hell. God didn't change that truth. He didn't get rid of it. Merely he knew that that was true about every single one of his children here on earth. And he responded to it with an even greater truth. He responded to it with a cross in his own son. Now he presents this truth. That by Jesus' blood, all of your stripes, or all of your sins have been taken away. By his stripes, we are healed. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's truth. He presents to us another proof with the open tomb. He gives us the truth that Jesus defeated death and the devil. And now he tells us that the truth is, you've defeated death and the devil as well. That when you die, you won't remain there. 
Because those who abide in Christ's word will never die. That's the truth. We hold on to these truths because these are the foundation of our faith. It's only upon this which we can hope. What a great promise we hear in verse 52. If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. I was encouraged to share with the congregation um, my, the uh, work that, I've done with, that we've done with a lady who just passed away recently, and she just had her funeral yesterday, on Friday. Her name was Serene Herlong. If you remember, we prayed for her here in church maybe three or four weeks ago. She passed away on March 25th. Her funeral was on Friday. That's why we have the flowers in the back of church. She was a friend of two of our members, Ed and Carol Morris. She was not a believer her entire life. She was 72 years old, and she was dying. And she reached out to them and asked if their pastor could come and see, come and see her. So I did. It was a Friday morning, and I went out to her house, and she was scared about a lot of things. She was scared what her husband was going to do without her. She was scared what her kids and her grandkids were going to do without her. She was scared about what they were going to remember about her, what their lasting memories of her would be. She was scared that her husband would forget that she loved him over 50 years of marriage. A lot of fears. And then she shared with me one fear which she had more than anything else. She said, I'm also scared of what God is going to think about me. So I asked her, you know, if you were to die today and you were standing before the Lord and he said, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? She said, well, I'm a, I'm a good mother. I'm a good wife. I'm not perfect in any way, but I try to be as best as I can be. I've never hurt anyone intentionally. I always try to be nice to people. He said, those are, those are good things, but it's not good enough. Sharing the truth of the law she realized that any step short of perfection meant that she deserved to be damned. Of course, this also presented the opportunity to share the wonderful truth about what Christ had done for her. Now, if you've ever been in a situation like that, it's, it's really hard to ever walk away. You just want to keep standing there and keep sharing the word because rationally you say, I need to argue them into believing. I need to present this in so many different ways that they can't possibly avoid coming to, the, to believe that this is true. And I realized then after a couple hours that you know, I wasn't going to be able to come to that conviction. It wasn't really up to me anyways. So I started leaving and she said, Pastor, that question you asked me at the beginning I think my entire life I would have said, I'm a good person, God, you know that. But now I think the only thing I could say is, well, you died for my sins, didn't you? Shocking to hear that wonderful truth proclaimed from the mouth of someone who their entire life had not believed those things. And she didn't keep it to herself either. The next, the next week I went back out and she told me that she'd been thinking about these things ever since then. She talked to her, her cleaning lady who had been in there, and she said, asked the cleaning lady the same question that I would asked, Serene. And the cleaning lady said, well, I would drop to my knees and beg for forgiveness. And Serene said, well, you know that Jesus already forgave you, right? The cleaning lady said something that many people believe. She said, yes, but I sin every single day, and if I don't repent for that day and I die, then I'll die with sins not having been forgiven. And Serene said, no, when, you, when Jesus died on the cross, he took away all your sins, even the ones that you haven't done yet. Just astounding that the Lord would work this faith in her heart. But of course, that is the result of when God's word is being spoken. When God speaks, he can make it work. Now, Serene never came in through these doors. She never put a dime in our offering plate. So by our visible measure of our visual measure of things, we'd say that nothing happened. And yet, there is a person whose soul is with the Lord today, who I'm convinced would not have been there if she died two months ago. This is astonishing. This is how God's word works. This is how God's word has worked in each of your hearts. So that when you heard his word, you believed not only believed it to be true, you believed that your entire hope for life after death depended upon what God says to you. This is exactly what happened in Serene's life. Thank God. 
for giving us that opportunity. Jesus says in John chapter 10, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Thanks be to God that he has spoken the word to each of you. That he's convinced you that what he says there is factually true. That Jesus did die. And that Jesus did rise. Thanks be to God that he has come into your hearts so that you also can confess that you have hope now. That you don't need to fear God or fear what God thinks about you. You already know what he thinks about you. May every single one of you then take this same word and use it for others. And know that when you are sharing God's word, it's not you speaking. It is God speaking. And God will cause people to listen. Thanks be to God, and may he help us in this mission towards others. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. continue by singing verses 1 through 4 of the hymn, which you can find on the back of your bulletin. You may be seated.
and ever-living King of all creation and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, hear our prayers. We thank you for the matchless gift of your Son, for the unsearchable wisdom which planned for our redemption through his death in our place, and for the promise of eternal inheritance through his death. Grant that through your Son we may have your richest blessings, the forgiveness of all our sins, deliver us from death and from the power of the devil, and the assurance of everlasting life. Help us faithfully to honor Christ our Lord by faith and life, and by word and deed. Help us to see clearly in him the eternal Godhead, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Inspire us to love and worship him in spirit and in truth. By your abounding grace, lift up your church, O God, that we may be saved from all weakness and failure, and be empowered for service in your kingdom. Govern the nations of the earth so that people may live everywhere without fear and in the light of your saving gospel. Give your grace to our homes and schools so that our youth may be trained for usefulness in this life and for entrance into the life which is to come. Bless all who labor with mind or hand in providing the things we need for daily living and give them the understanding that in all human toil we are accountable to you. Help us to use our gifts as your stewards and for your glory. Dear Lord, be the comforter of the suffering and the afflicted, the aged, and those who are weak in body or in spirit. Be the supplier of those in need, the protector of the fatherless and the defenseless, and the light of salvation for all people. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior, in whose name we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please rise, and we'll continue with the order of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. It is right and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be fully pre be pre might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper, gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. You may be seated. 
Because we believe the Lord's Supper to be an expression of complete unity of faith, we ask that at this time only those who are communicant members of Emmanuel or of another congregation within the Church of the Lutheran Confession approach under the usher's direction. If you would like to receive communion with us in the future, please speak to me after the service. The Savior invites, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, now let your servant depart in heavenly peace, for I have seen the